find somebody to lay hands on and cast something out. You're dreaming about casting out devils, healing the sick and raising the dead. Others want to talk about their golf score. You want to talk about the glory of God. Satan, you will obey the word of the resurrected Lord. In the name of Jesus, we command you, loose your hold upon these people. Loose your hold upon their minds. Welcome again to the Discipleship Course. We are powerfully going through this teaching on the armor of God. Let's quickly go to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, you're going to be camping out here for a number of weeks, so just deal with it. I mean, it's, it's incredible stuff. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. Oh, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, remember what we've been teaching, that each piece of the armor is a revelation and is only put on by you entering into the manifestation or the experience of that revelation. We dealt the last two lessons on truth. And the only way that truth becomes that belt that you put on is not by, and I know we've been making fun of this, but it's not by ritualistically going through saying, I put on the belt of truth, click. I put on the, shield, or the breastplate of righteousness. I take up the shield of faith, put on my nice little purdy hat. No, it's not the way it works. My little Ormani shoes. No, it's not the way. You don't go through a ritualistic process. Each piece of the armor is a revelation and is put on by you entering into the manifestation of that revelation. As you enter into the manifestation of truth, as you embrace truth, as you come under the control of truth, as your mind becomes filled with truth, as you open your mouth and speak truth, then you will begin to have the belt of truth that will shore you up and begin to protect you from the, sh uh, from the uh, assaults of the enemy. But he said, put on the whole armor. You got to take it all on. And so now we're going to go into the next piece, which is the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate, it covers the entire midsection of the body. It protects the vital organs. It protects the vital organs. And he says that righteousness is that thing that protects the vital organs. It protects the most sensitive, the most vulnerable parts of who you are, that it is righteousness that protects us. Put that deep in your spirit. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. The word righteous means equity of character. It literally means the equality of the character of God, equal with the character of God. It speaks of God's nature, which is holiness. For our God is holy. He is a holy God. And righteousness speaks of the equality of the character of God, the nature of God, equal with the character of God. And the Bible says, that we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That we are to line up with the character and nature of God in Christ Jesus. And there's two dimensions of that. There is that righteousness which is imputed to us. It means it's credited to us, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. And then there's the righteousness that is imparted into us, that empowers us to walk with what God has already credited us with having. Harama, we'll put that deep in your spirit. We're going to come back to that next lesson. But it's equity of character. If you look deeper in the original, it literally means a plumb line. You know, a plumb line, uh, for those of you that uh, are, 
or builders understand. You lay out a plumb line. I, I did a little construction. Uh, I didn't last in that job very long. <laughs> you could, do it, well, just hang out with me when I try to build something. You'll find out why. But anyways, I, I helped lay ceiling tiles. And we would lay out a plumb line because that, that the tile, we, we would lay out the grid work for the tile, and then you put the tiles in, but the metal grid work. And it had to be even, otherwise your whole ceiling was like this. It had to be perfectly even. But in order to line up all the grid work, the metal pieces, we had to lay down a plumb line first all the way around so it would be even around the whole room. We laid down a plumb line. Now, often today, they, they use uh, lasers, but it's still a plumb line. It's a perfectly lined up. And, and righteousness speaks of that plumb line. It is that that perfect line of the character and nature of God, and we are to line up with that character and nature of God. We are to line up with that character and nature of God. Now, I want you to put this very deep in your spirit because we're going to talk about in a little bit how holiness empowers us and releases power, how righteousness, because it speaks of the holiness of God, the character and nature of God. Righteousness is equality with the character of God. The character of God is the holiness of God. It's an interesting phenomenon in natural life, but if you'll take a power line, running it perfectly straight, and run a tremendous amount of power through it, if you'll take another copper line, totally separate, just bring it near the line that power is going through, and line it up exactly plumb with the original power line, the line that has no power being thrown into it from any generator will actually begin to carry a current. The more it's lined up, it'll actually carry the current along with it. It's a stunning phenomenon. And as we line up, as our life lines up to the, with the character of God, the power that's inherent in God begins to flow through us. Put that deep in your spirit. God has called us to rise up to His standard of righteousness to his standard of holiness. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He said who he foreknew, he predestined destined us to be what? To be conformed into the image of his son. Now, does that mean I'm going to have a beard like Jesus? Does that mean I'm going to walk around and look just like his physical body? No. I'm going to be like him in his nature. I'm going to be conformed to him in his nature. And the nature of God is holiness. I'm going to say that again. The nature of God is holiness. And God pre-planned, God predestined, God set it in motion that you and I would line up with his character, would line up with his nature, would line up with righteousness, with holiness. Let's look at a few verses here. Romans chapter 6, verse 19. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Look at the strongness of the word. Have you ever thought that? He said you're to be a slave of righteousness for holiness. Holiness. You're to be a slave of righteousness, a slave to the equality, the equity of the character of God, a slave to holiness. We live in a day today where people say, well, I'm just free, Brother Steve. We're all free. We're free from legalism. We're free from all that kind of preaching. We're free from all that. We're just free to go be in Jesus and just do whatever we want to do. We can, we can, we can, well, we know we shouldn't drink. We shouldn't smoke. We shouldn't sleep around. But outside, you know, we're free. Well, even in that, they don't, they do that anymore. We're free to drink. We're free to smoke. I know preachers out there boozing up. I had a young man call me up. He was youth pastoring at this church up in Kansas and his heart was broken. He said, Pastor Steve. Because he was raised up in our ministry, one of our disciples. He said, Pastor Steve, he said, I don't understand this. He said, I'm in a Pentecostal, supposed revival hungry church. I go over to the pastor's house. He asked me to get something from the fridge in the garage. I go out there and it's filled with beers. It's filled with beers. It's theirs. 
And I told him, I said, you see, a lot of people, they, it doesn't matter anymore. They've lowered the standards. They've lowered, the, 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 they've lowered their, their, their levels. It doesn't matter. It used to be a good Christian didn't drink, smoke, and cuss. Now they do it all. And we're all free to do it because they're not pursuing holiness. They're not pursuing righteousness. But Paul said, you're to be a slave to holiness. Well, I'll be Steve, I don't like the way that sounds. I know because you think, because the devil sold you on a lie, that holiness is a prison. You think holiness is bondage. The devil has sold the church on a lie that holiness is somehow a bondage. That holiness is somehow a prison. It's just like the devil sold people on a lie that submission is bondage. And the submission is a prison. And yet submission is incredibly freeing. My wife teaches an incredible message on that. And, and sharing with young ladies about how submission is freeing and empowering. But see, the devil sold us through the lie, through the media and everything else. That holiness is somehow restrictive and bondage. And he it propagates that lie. And he Pers pursues that lie. We see it on television. We see it through the movies. We see it through everything else. They're always presenting preachers of holiness as stiff and rigid and bitter and old and boring. Come on, somebody. You know, and ir ir irrelevant to society and stuck in the old ways. And that they're always the ones, they're always the bad guy, and they're always the ones standing in the way of progress. They're always the ones standing in the way. Let me tell you something prophetically in the name of Jesus. The day is coming when the preachers of holiness, unlike even more than today, are going, and specifically the preachers of holiness and the carriers of righteousness, are going to be blamed for the world's problems. We're going to be blamed for the world's problems. They're mocking us. My family and I just went, uh, we, I, don't, I, I don't go to very many movies, but we went to a little kid movie just, just yesterday. And here in the middle, and it was funny, all, about halfway through it, and then halfway through it, they all of a sudden turned, and they made a mockery and slammed preachers of holiness and painted them in such the most horrible light. And that those who rebuked the system and rebelled against them, they were the ones that really were enlightened. These were the ones that were really free. And I looked at that. I nearly walked out of the movie, but I knew I was going to share with my children afterwards what this wickedness was. But when I saw it coming, I turned to my son and next to me and I said, get ready. Christianity is just about to get slammed. And you know what? Most Christians didn't even pick it up. We read some Christian reviews before we went, and they said, oh, it's a funny movie. Oh, it's family friendly. Oh, you ought to go. They didn't even pick it up because they're not sensitive to the fact because many of them believe that holiness and righteousness is old religion and not the present manifestation of God. But I'm telling you in the name of Jesus, God is going to release a new wave of holiness upon the body of Christ. He says, we are to be slaves of righteousness in holiness. Let's go to Romans chapter 6, verse 22. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, there it is again, you have your fruit to holiness and the end is everlasting life. You have your fruit to holiness and the end result of a holy life is everlasting life. I don't know what the opposite is, but I think you can figure that one out. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now, folks, stay with me on this. Remember we talked about holiness is a, it's, it, it, it protects you. We're going to get there in a moment. It protects you. It's a weapon of warfare to fight the devil. And now listen what God says. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, if we really believe the word of God, if we really believe what this word said, if we were really, like we talked about in the last few lessons, lovers of truth, if we really were submitting and yielding ourselves to truth, don't you think we would spend a significant amount of time preaching holiness because we know, according to the word, without holiness, no one will see the Lord? We claim that we're leading them to Jesus when we're not preaching holiness. Now, some of you, Harama Sunday, 
Haramasata. Some of you in your minds right now are just running wild. Haramasata. In your minds, you're, you're sitting there thinking, oh, now here he goes. He's going to start preaching legalism. That's because you don't even know what legalism is. You don't even know what legalism is. See, you think holiness is legalistic. God spoke to me a number of years ago, and he said, son, he said, what most people call legalism, I call holiness. I'm going to say that again. I'm telling you, thus saith the Lord as a prophet of God. God said, spoke to me. He said, son, what most people today call legalism, I call holiness. You see, true legalism is the usage of specific living a certain lifestyle, doing and obeying certain principles in order to garner the favor of God. That's legalism. Well, we don't do that. I don't live holy to get God's favor. No, I have God's favor right now. It is by grace, the undeserved, unmerited favor of God that I am saved. I have, and we're going to get into this in next lesson. I have the grace of God. I have the favor of God. But because I have the favor of God, now I choose and now I live holy. I pursue holiness, not, be, not, not in order to get the favor, but because I have the favor that is the pursuit of God. That is the pursuit of holiness. Haramasata, haramoshane. Holiness is power. Holiness is power. Hushaka. It's a mighty weapon. He says it's a shield that protects us. Holiness is a shield. Who, my Father God, that protects us. I want you to go to Exodus. Exodus, excuse me, chapter fifteen, verse twenty-six. Holiness protects us. It covers the vital organs, the most sensitive parts of our spirit man. Haramasa karamasande. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. And he said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. God says, if you live and pursue holiness, I will protect you from the diseases. Not just natural diseases, because all of this speaks to us today spiritually. But the diseases, not only physically. Listen, listen, please, please, I don't get mad at me. But the fact is, there are many people that are sick today because they're living in sin. Hey, the Bible says it. He said there's those of you that are even die because they did not partake of the Lord's Supper correctly. But they did not treat and honor the body of the Lord and deal with it appropriately because they were dealing with it glibly and sin. Actually, disease entered in, sickness entered in, and even death entered in. There are Now, I'm not saying every time someone gets sick, it's because they're living in sin, but sickness is a result of sin. And God says, though, if you live righteous, guys, we've got to rise up to this level. If you live holy, I will actually protect you from diseases, not only natural diseases, but Mental diseases, physical diseases, financial diseases, family diseases, the poison of the fruit of sin. God says, if you pursue me, if you go after me, if you obey my commandments, if you follow my statutes, I will protect you. Why? Ho Listen to me, church. Holiness is not restrictive. Holiness is freeing. And holiness protects. It protects your family. It protects. It protects. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. For Proverbs 16, verse 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he, God, makes his enemies to be at peace with him. And now look at this, Isaiah chapter 54. This is so powerful. Father, I give you praise. Beginning with verse 14. In righteousness... God says, you shall be established. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. You shall not fear or, uh, you, sh yeah, you shall not fear you or from terror, for it shall not come near you. 
Indeed, they shall surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work. And I have created the spoiler to destroy. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue who rises against you in judgment, you shall contemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and the righteousness is of me, says the Lord. Now, we always jump around and say, oh, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But that only speaks to those who are living righteous, who are pursuing righteousness. Look at the context, guys. Verse 14, in righteousness you shall be established. In righteousness you shall be established. When you're walking in righteousness, when you're pursuing holiness, it protects you. It'll protect you from the assaults of the enemy. It'll protect your family from the assaults of the enemy. That's why I teach so often, moms and dads, you got to put up a wall of holiness in your house. You got to put up a wall of holiness and Filter that devil vision, that television. You got to put up a wall of holiness and watch what your children are looking at on the internet. Be careful. You know, over 70% of 15 year olds are looking at internet pornography, the, uh, the statistics say. And look, put a wall of holiness with the video games that you allow them to watch. Put a wall of holiness with the music you let come into the house. Put a wall of holiness. You say, oh, brother Steve, that's too difficult. It's too hard. All the things we got to battle with our kids, you know, they, 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 they're they so influenced by their friends. Are you still a parent? Is that still your house? Then you got to be willing to fight that battle. You got to be willing to stand up. You say, oh, they are so mad at me. Hey, let me tell you something. I would rather guard them and protect them now and fight the battle now than to have to face eternity knowing that my child is spending the eternity burning in hell because I didn't build a wall of holiness in my house and I allowed the wickedness of the enemy to penetrate into my home and to steal my children. How far are you willing to fight? You say that's too harsh. Nothing is too harsh to save your family from an eternity in hell, from the torment of the devil. Nothing is too harsh. Nothing is too hard. No battle is not worth fighting. Karamasha, karamasha. I remember a young 12-year-old girl who was going out every night partying, 12 years old, getting drunk, doing drugs, and her mother knew about it. She came to me in the youth group. She would tell me. She started coming. She would tell me what she was doing, and she came to me the third week. I, I never forget this as long as I live. She came to me in tears, and she said, I told my mother I was going to go out. I told her I was going to sleep with my boyfriend. I told her I was going to get high and get drunk. And she said, go ahead. And she said, why doesn't my mother love me? Why doesn't my mother stop me? Why does she say this? Why doesn't she stand in front of the door and block me? Do you understand how many of the children are crying out? Why don't my parents protect me? Oh, on one side, they're fighting you and fighting you. But deep on the inside, they want a, a parent. They want one that will stand up and fight for them and say, no matter whether you hate me, no matter whether you never want to talk to me again, I'm going to build a wall of holiness around you. And I'm going to guard you and protect you from the devil as long as I can. That's not restrictive. That's not legalistic parents. That's not being a controlling parent. That's called passion and mercy. To build a wall of holiness around. To go in there. Be aware. You got to know what are they listening to? What ungodly music and words are they pumping in their ears? See, God said that no weapon is going to be formed against you shall prosper only when you pursue righteousness. Only when you pursue holiness. Shakarama Sunday. That's why we got to stop taking these scriptures out of context and, and, and teach all these people, oh, clean that, run around and say, oh, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Yeah, if you're living righteous, otherwise you're vulnerable because righteousness is, the sh is that shield, that's, uh, that, that, that breastplate that protects the most vulnerable parts of you. Put this in your spirit. See, holiness protects you also quickly. Holiness empowers us. Holiness empowers us. It's not weak. It's not restrictive. That's why the devil's so terrified of it. It's power. Romans chapter 1 verse 4. And declare to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power. According 
to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. It is because of the power of the spirit of holiness that that's what caused Jesus to be raised from the dead. Look at what he said. He said, and Jesus would declare to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. He was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness. Remember what I talked about? That God's character is the plumb line. Like the two uh, electrical lines lined up next to each other. When, we, when Jesus was lined up with the character nature of the father. Because Jesus did not do anything here on this earth in his own inherent power. He did not do anything on his earth in his own inherent nature. But when he lined up with the power of God. When he lined up with the nature of God, when he lined up, the same power that flowed through the Father flowed through him. That's called the spirit of holiness. When Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness. According to the spirit of holiness. Holiness empowers us. Holiness empowers us. 